Welcome to Thinking Deeply About Primary Education, the podcast that makes time and space to really think about pedagogy, teaching and learning, professional development, anything of interest to time poor but enthusiasm rich primary teachers. This week, I'm joined by Christopher Such. Hello again, everyone. And together, we'll try to answer the question How do you solve a problem like primary science? But first, Chris, what are you reading for? I've been reading a paper called Habit Formation Limits Teacher Effectiveness by Sam Sims, Michael Hobbis and Rebecca Allen. Effectively, the idea behind it is it describes in decent detail for those who aren't familiar with the subject, like me, um, what habitual behaviour is. And effectively, it goes through this idea of how habits are something that are necessary to the development of expertise but at the same time if those habits are not ones that you're after they're really undif- they're really difficult to unpick those of you who have been interested in the podcast for a while might recognize a link there to a paper i talked about earlier which related to the double edged sword of cognitive load and unsurprisingly they reference this paper here um effectively what this paper does is kind of get into the nitty gritty of how we get around that. How do we deal with habit formation and how do we deal with unpicking habits? And it talks about how we need to get into the the real context of where we act upon those habits in order to unpick them at the moment. It reaches a conclusion that unsurprisingly, you might think relating to um, a lot of the things that you might see on edu twitter or elsewhere talks about the value of instructional coaching because of how that can work in a given setting and how deliberate practice which is a key part of instructional coaching can inform that I, i found it really fascinating one of these papers that despite being quite dense and at points you know you can get caught up in the weeds constantly drags you back in with a little summary or a little this is what we're talking about here to get you back on board a bit like a really good lecturer does where you know you might get lost a little bit and they say in other words and they just drag you back in to check that you're understanding which is which is really good i just wanted to add very briefly the more i I, the more i read about and listen to things about instructional coaching the more and i think we've talked about this before the more I fear that some people might misinterpret that as an overemphasis on generic pedagogy and a focus on that. One of the things I've been really pleased to see in the time I've been on Edu Twitter in the last two or three years has been lots more talk about pedagogical content knowledge, not just how do you teach, but how do you teach that? And I think there's arguably something Um, underneath the surface of this paper that needs a bit wider discussion because this is really about how do we stop teachers reaching a particular plateau after four or five years and yet in my experience after four and five years when it comes to supporting teachers to break through that plateau it's often more about pedagogical content knowledge than it is about generic pedagogical stuff though there are exceptions to that of course um that sounds great um i'm gonna read that as soon as we finish um tonight um yeah because is, is that um alan and sims both contributed to that paper yep alan sims and hobbis nice um yeah that's gonna be good um i, I like your caveat as well chris because um yeah big fan of them um, when possible you know i think that you've said to me in the past once you get to a certain point most teachers have the generic down and it's really getting under the skin of the of the mathematics in my case. That that's one of the best parts of my job. And yes, that, that sounds like a fantastic paper. And I think I've gone for the most recent paper. Um, 10 days, a time of recording. <laughs> Is this no, you setting a challenge? 20 days. From now, from now on, we're gonna have to go for the most recent paper we can possibly find. Uh, we could try, or the oldest. Um, and it is called Principles for the Design of a Fully Resourced, Coherent, Research-Informed School Mathematics Curriculum. And it's by Colin Foster, Tom Frankham, Dave Hewitt, and Chris Shore. Um, and I just happened to be, I was looking for an assignment, um, and I just happened to click on Maths from 2021. 
And I thought that is, that is exactly what we've been talking about on many occasions. Um, I'm going to read that. And essentially what they say is that um, most schools have two options. Um, I won't give away the whole paper, but you can either adopt one of the many commercial schemes available, um, you know, as paper-based or online, or you can, as we've advised against, curate a detailed bespoke scheme of learning yourself. They outline why they think that's a bad idea. And then they give five principles for curriculum design. So I think that anyone who is interested in listening to us jabber on about this topic will be really interested to listen to read what people who know what they're talking about um, have to say on, on, the, on the subject. <laughs> I'm not sure I like the implication there, Kieran, but yeah, no, that, that sounds perfectly accurate as well. I think there's 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 lots to agree with. Um, I haven't decided where I come down on it because, like I said, it was 7th of April, today's the 27th. Um, so I need to read it a few more times, but it is a it's a it's a really interesting um paper that I just happened to to come across one morning. Um yeah, so I, I highly recommend it. And I think it is open access by Taylor and Francis. Um, I think the bulk of this episode is going to focus on primary science and um, something I know you're really passionate about, Chris, and something that we didn't have a chance to give attention to during season two and um, where we had those subject specific episodes. And um, so I think to kick us off, what to you is the ultimate goal of primary science? The ultimate goal is, I think, quite simple to state, which is I think that we want children to begin to grasp what science is and begin to grasp the body of knowledge that science has bestowed upon us. That sounds quite simple until you realize the difficulties, particularly in that first one of what science is, the disciplinary knowledge of science, what it means to begin to understand the scientific method. I mean, the deeper you get into any kind of philosophy of science, the more you realize that there is no consensus about exactly what the scientific method is but I think in some ways we're in a nicer position at primary school in that we've got an excuse to boil it down to something simpler but in short yeah that ultimate goal is to begin to grasp what science is and to begin to grasp the body of knowledge that science has bestowed upon us in getting ready for this podcast I went back to look at something that I read a long time ago when I first became a science coordinator. And it comes from a very different Ofsted era. It's, uh, I think it's one of the last things they put out in like the old era, which is called Maintaining Curiosity. And it effectively talked about what makes a quality science curriculum, make what makes quality science teaching, and of course, what makes quality science leadership, which is obviously a big part of those two. And the essential thing behind this was it talked a lot of sense, but the, it had this overarching message of first and foremost, make sure that you maintain children's curiosity in the subject of science, which you can sense the Rousseau behind that. The idea that children arrive at school with this inherent view or this in inherent love of what it is that we deem science to be. And the first thing we need to do is to leave that unharmed as if no teaching is better than mediocre teaching, which I'm not so sure is the case. However, there is lots of sense in there. And I do think that something that wasn't contained in my definition of the ultimate goal of science is the sense that we do want to put across this idea that science is a really fascinating, glorious subject. But I like to think that's sort of a given and that's not specific to science. That's something that should apply to every sub subject that we teach. Just to go back a tiny bit, the report, when I say it makes some sensible suggestions, it effectively says that we need to build scientific knowledge. We need to understand the value of science. We need to enjoy working scientifically and we need to sustain interest. I think it's noteworthy that two of those are talking about enjoyment and again like I say it points to a slightly different Ofsted era with mostly negatives but some positives but I think a crucial part of that is getting children to know what science is and I'll talk about this a little bit more later I think it's essential that schools make it a key part of any 
area of curriculum that they teach, but especially science, that children come away with a pretty ready-made definition of what science is. I think if a child leaves in year six and they can't tell you what they think science is in their own words, that you've probably missed a trick there. And we need to get children to understand this key idea that it's based around, it's a way of understanding the world that involves observation, measurement and experiment. And ideally the creation and testing of hypotheses, all of those things that can be shown to children stage by stage from year one to year six. But yeah, that kind of is the ultimate goal of science, getting them to know what it is and to begin to be introduced to that joyous body of knowledge that um, is contained within it. Um, I, th I think I probably, I don't know, need to put my cards on the table because if I had control of what was taught in primary schools, I would have three subjects, reading, writing, and mathematics, because I think our priority at primary should be a focus on those subjects which will allow our children, our pupils to embrace the academic rigor that, for instance, science can have in the secondary phase when they're taught by specialists who know a whole lot more about science than I do. The way the school day and the school curriculum is set up, it's not necessarily um, designed in such a way that we can really do science the justice it deserves to be done. You know, if, if for instance, we had specialist teachers at, at the primary phase, you know, say from year four upwards, then I'd be 100% on board with that. And, um, you know, I really like your ultimate goal of understanding what science is. And, um, but I almost wish that we had the capacity to really get all of our pupils to there. And in a way that they were prepared, like I said, for the academic rigor that a proper dive into the subject can offer when they turn 12, 11, 12, 13 years old, you know? So I don't know, it, it possibly controversial, um, but I'm not saying I don't like science. I absolutely love it. I just wish we had the capacity to do it the full justice it deserved. I, I, I know where you're coming from. I, I think there's definitely an extent to which, well, my cards on the table used to be as frequent listeners, listeners will know, because I repeat myself often, used to be a key stage three intervention teacher. And originally at the very start, I was a key stage three intervention science teacher until we realized that basically all the kids that couldn't do science particularly well also couldn't read particularly well, coincidentally, which might kind of speak to what you're talking about. So I have some sympathy with that. Um, I would say that if you looked at the school day and said, you know, in the five and a half ish hours of teaching time that we have with children, I think if we focused on reading, writing and maths without diving into the other subjects, without informing that through a study of history, through a study of geography, through a study of science, I think it get dry very quickly. But in some ways, I think there's a compromised position between what I might think and what you um, seem to suggest in that you could strongly, you could definitely make the argument that the teaching of science, the teaching of history, the teaching of geography, that all of these things can be roots into reading effectively. They can be an excuse for though, if you're that way inclined to get children better at reading, but you might as well be learning content as you go. And, and as we've discussed, as I've obviously just discussed before, when we were talking about reading, knowing about the world, be that science, geography, history, um, religious education, etc. That is a key, a key part of being able to read. So it's I, I, as soon as we discount that from the curriculum, I think we do children a bit of a disservice when we get to, you know, when we want them to understand what they read. The other thing I'd say is, you mentioned earlier how passionate I am for science. I, I love science like you do. I, it's fantastic subject. I studied chemistry at university, etc. Hated teaching it. Always hated teaching it. And that's one of the things that I will discuss very briefly. But there's, um, 
yeah, there are aspects of it that I find hugely challenging in primary school for exactly the reasons that I think you are hinting at here, relating to misconceptions, relating to us not having necessarily the equipment that's ready, et cetera, et cetera. One thing I would say for science, and maybe this is a bit highfalutin for a primary school teacher to be going on about, but I'm going to say it anyway. One thing I love about it is it's a subject that inherently teaches children about the fallibility of human knowledge. Now, you can make an argument that, say, history does that as well when we're talking about um, reliability of sources and you know, you can talk about different perspectives when you talk about people's re uh, relationship with a given place in geography. But it's this idea of fallibility of human knowledge is baked into science in a way that I think is really valuable for children to imbibe. So even if it was just for that, I would be keen to keep science on the curriculum. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I'm under no illusions that, um, that what I hold is a mainstream. It's, 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 it's a very niche view. Um, and, it, and it's completely in hypotheticals. I think one of the reasons why we end up with some reluctance in the teaching of science um, and the inclusion of science across the primary curriculum, and you're not the first person I've come across who would suggest that we might sometimes do more harm than good. I think one of the, the reason why this often comes about is that in a lot of my teaching career, there's been an attempt to teach science as a miniature version of what real scientists do. So at every stage, it's been like, oh, well, this is, is this what real scientists do? Is this what well, we really teach them the scientific method if we do X, Y, and Z? I think that's, it's so misguided. Of all the subjects, as soon as you get into actual research, Briefly, I mean, I only went as far as a master's, but I did a bit of research. The stuff we teach to children is uh, when it comes to, oh, this is the scientific method or this is coming up with your own inquiry question. It is as far removed from the reality and as distorted from the reality as the way we get them to do newspaper articles. You know, you know, when we get them to write a headline and we get them to write it in columns in pencil, as if that somehow relates to journalism. It's a, a lot of what we do in science that is disciplinary, even the stuff that's in the national curriculum, is so far removed from actual, for want of a better phrase, grown up or professional science as to not be worth the name. What were the biggest challenges that you found when you were teaching it in the classroom? There were three main challenges, um, and I think I've already alluded to them a little bit. Um, time, um, you know, I, I, I don't think I've ever managed to teach everything for as long as it was needed. Um, you know, and that's through multiple, multiple schools, multiple timetable arrangements. Um, I just find, I just find that the school day um, it does doesn't doesn't connect with with what we need to do and um, you know that that might just be me but i think you know from speaking to people i think time is a big issue especially when it comes to the foundation subjects and um, the second will be subject knowledge and um, in in the episode with jack harker in season one i talked about the i think it was a stanford or Yale, one of the one of those sort of Ivy League universities, um, where they they did this study, and it was about why do we have seasons? I think, um, and it's not about proximity to the sun; it's about the the angle um, during different seasons. When when I read that, I'm all, I'm not convinced I could teach that properly, and um, I'm not convinced I could avoid that misconception, and so I think subject knowledge and um, with in the absence of you know something akin to the maths hubs you know because I, I know there are organizations who do help and um, but i think uh, my teaching certainly would have benefited from a bit more intensity in terms of you know what what was on offer to support and um, the teaching of the subject and, and the third was, was always resourcing. 
you know, because even though, you know, I've worked in schools where the resort, there have been plentiful resources, the amount of things that you need to do in a day, certainly I always felt like I was, um, you know, rushing around lunchtime to get the bakers and pipettes ready or the, um, you know, the scales or the, you know, even the ramps for when you're doing thing, you know, lessons on f- friction and stuff like that there. Um, you know, so th- those three, you know, the time, the knowledge and the resourcing, the act of resourcing more than anything. Um, I, I think were our big challenges, certainly in my own practice um, and my own experience. Um, but I do think they generalize, um, if not on a national scale, potentially a, a much wider, possibly global scale. Well, I'd imagine there's a good chance they do generalize because you've basically said the same things that I would go with, with, with a few differences. I, the first thing that jumped out at me was subject knowledge. There are definitely some issues with subject knowledge. I think of, of all the subjects, it's one where some misconceptions can lead to some really iffy teaching not just teaching something a bit wrong but teaching something that's literally the opposite of what you want children to learn the classic of that is things like heavier objects fall faster i've seen um, particular investigations which teachers do whereby if you make a like a paper helicopter that falls down if you add extra paper clips to it it pulls it down in such a way that it changes the shape of the helicopter and then the one with more paper clips on it falls faster. So you are literally giving children an experiment that, or an inquiry that embeds a particular misconception that they are likely to bring to the table. So yeah, subject knowledge is a big deal. However, there are ways around that. So for example, I think if as if subject leaders make sure, or school leaders, I should say, make sure that there's the time built into the school day or the school half term or whatever it is for teachers to sit down together and to look through what it is they need to know in order to teach a subject. That goes hand in hand with a quality curriculum. If you've got a curriculum that's effectively, here are the national curriculum statements, have at it, then you're setting teachers up to fail in a lot of circumstances. Most of them won't have dealt with science in, you know, five or six years if they're new to the profession or much longer if they're a bit more experienced. And yeah, like I say, you're setting them up to fail. So a quality curriculum will help out with that. One that really gets into the specific details of what children need to know, that points out the potential misconceptions. A curriculum document that isn't saying this is a misconception, be careful here, isn't really doing its job properly um, or it isn't doing it to the, to its fullest extent. Yeah, I think that's key because as you're speaking, I'm thinking what really troubles me is not knowing that I have a misconception, you know, because I've definitely spoken to my six-year-old about something and then read something that I realized I shouldn't have spoken to him about that because it was wrong. And, um, and yeah, it, it's, it's the not knowing if there was such a thing that would highlight what you think might not be true, you know, highlight those misconceptions. I think that that'll be really powerful. And um, yeah. For those people who are interested in subject knowledge, there's a really simply put together and really useful book called teaching primary science by Peter Riley, really nice little read, goes through the science curriculum from year one to year six, spelling out these sorts of things, looking at particular misconceptions, looking at the the subject knowledge of the national curriculum, the stuff you'll need to know, and does so in a really accessible fashion. I found that really useful when I was uh, teaching science. Um, Great, yeah, great book, that. Another of these challenges that I would mention is linked to the one you mentioned which is inquiries you talked about equipment this is the reason why inquiries are a pain because like you say you have to run around at lunchtime finding the beakers and more often than not the science cupboard in a primary school is a bit of a disorganized mess that's the uh, the amount of time i've led science in a couple of schools and in both occasions both occasions when it was handed over to me as the role, they said, oh, here's the folder. Sorry about the science cupboard. And yeah, it is. It's because you think that it's a relatively small component of your job and it should be. 
but I would end up spending a couple of days every academic year in the summer holidays just trying to tidy it up because often you've got loads of equipment that people think is a good idea and really you need less of that and that's something I'll come on to a little bit later what I would say is as a teacher if you can keep your investigation simple keep your inquiries manageable and by that I mean if you are going to have more than six pieces of equipment per group or per pair then perhaps think again there is probably something simpler that you can do and I know lots of people who are really into their science teaching might describe a lot of what I say in this podcast as lacking in ambition but in the schools I've worked in having really really high ambitions from the get-go has led to teachers disengaging from the subject if they if the first two inquiries they go to teach are unmanageable they are probably not going to do the third or fourth inquiry and they're just going to apologize for it or they'll pretend to do it or they'll just model it at the front and pretend that the children have done the inquiry that's what i see if you don't keep it simple you will end up with a very superficial um, interaction with inquiries in the classroom you have to start off basic and simple so that teachers and so well so that you can actually just in, in, in so that you can undertake these in the classroom with some success and start to build up your confidence a little i would say linked to that another problem is the working scientifically part of the national curriculum which is all about or it's not all about, but it's almost entirely about how you deal with scientific inquiry. It ties back into that, that problem I have with the national curriculum that I mentioned earlier, which is this idea of it being a miniature version of what real science is or trying to be and failing at that. And teachers need to be willing to kind of take their own route around that and not worry so much about exactly that disciplinary knowledge. But that said, in order to do justice to the working scientifically part of the national curriculum, what you really need is in advance to work out what those very general statements mean in precise terms. So where it says, for example, taking measurements using a range of scientific equipment with increasing accuracy and precision, well, that can mean anything. You really need to specify as a teacher before you begin that, oh, this year, what I mean by that is using Newton meters, using reading measuring cylinders accurately, using weighing scales and rulers. And fancy though that objective sounds, if I get the kids doing those four things, I'm happy for that for this year. Because again, that may sound unambitious, but the reality is that in a lot of schools, then they're not doing that. They're not up to that point because it isn't specified. So yeah being looking at those working scientifically criteria and breaking down before you teach them what they mean and then giving yourself a break not thinking about the 20 different measuring instruments that you might get children to use and just thinking we get i'm going to make sure those four are good and that my the children in my class are really solid at using those four is generally the way to go but as actually if there's one message to take away from this podcast it will, relating to the national curriculum is don't be afraid to simple, take a simple version of what you think the statements are saying and then really nail it rather than try and get into intricate detail and get lost. There'll be plenty of time for that intricate detail if you get the basics right first. Thinking about inquiries and working scientifically, there is a tendency to... And I know where this tendency comes from because I've literally delivered CPD that says this or at some point, and I apologize to ex-colleagues for this. There is a tendency to think, let's do inquiries to learn something. When you do inquiries, the thing you are learning is how to do inquiries. You are learning how to use the equipment. You are learning how to record your results. You're learning how to do an inquiry without spilling a beaker full of liquid all over your book. That's what you're learning. If you're trying to teach children about gravity while they're using Newton meters, no chance. Teach it first and then once you've taught it, do an inquiry that solidifies that or maybe goes into a little bit of depth or gives children the chance towards the end of 
primary school to ask some, their, some of their own questions that relate to this learning. The great advantage of that beyond the minimizing of, not minimizing, the reduction of unnecessary cognitive load. The other great advantage of that is the fact that if the inquiry doesn't quite go to plan, you can say, well, we know that what should have happened, why do we think this didn't work? And you can talk about the equipment, you can talk about imprecisions in data, this sort of thing. Whereas if you try and teach children the science through the inquiry and the inquiry goes wrong, then you've started with a misconception. So you, you really need to teach it first and then do the inquiry. And that, that's actually what I was going to jump in with. And um, because the day I heard that, it was like, it, it, was, it was a thunderbolt, you know, for an old callback. And um, how did I not realize, <laughs> you know, how, um, and, and my understanding of, of how things could have been done, you know, and, and, um, much more effectively, you know, became really apparent. And um, so I, I think you're absolutely spot on. And um, yeah, in terms of, um, yeah, because the, the number of times inquiries didn't go as planned, but I had nothing to fall back on. And, um, you know, I, I'm painting myself as a really bad science teacher. <laughs> um, but it, it's, it's been a while. <laughs> um, I think that leads into something that I'm going to say a little bit later as well about inquiries, about this, and this is, ideally, this is something that your science lead will be dealing with, but as an individual teacher, have a think through about a scientific inquiry. Firstly, does it actually reinforce something I've taught? The number of scientific inquiries I've seen with things like skittles in water, lovely, if you're doing some art on it, and you can take a photograph of it, and you're looking at the way the colours bleed into one another, lovely why not but it probably isn't particularly effective science the, the other thing i was going to say related to inquiries is not being afraid to take it step by step with children particularly further down the school being willing to say okay we're going to place our measuring cylinder in front of us just here has everybody done that wonderful okay next we're going to pour water up to this mark here let me show you under the visualizer and just doing it step by step for you to have success with those inquiries where the children are beginning to be independent, you have to have guided them through things like pouring water from a beaker into a cylinder, looking at the line on a measuring cylinder. You have to have gone through the little details about calibrating a Newton meter so you're actually starting at zero. All of these little things, if you just end up giving six or seven instructions, even if they're written down for children, and then saying, have at it, you've got a recipe for chaos, unless you're very, very fortunate with the class you happen to be teaching. Very occasionally, you will get a class, usually a more mature year five or year six class, where you can get away with this sort of stuff. But more often than not, you want to hide into nothing. Yeah, there's, um, there's parallels with maths there, because when I think about, I suppose, around year three, and you introduce the idea of working systematically. Your best friend in that situation is the table. You know, um, I'm thinking of the investigation where you've got some cubes and they're in a, in a tower and you can see the faces around the side and you can see one on top. And essentially you can generalize how to work out N faces, you know, based on the number of cubes. Um, and I always use that and I will explicitly demonstrate and support them step by step um, in the use in the effective use of a table you know step number faces and then a space for the pattern and i've seen johnny hall do this with them you know on, on the lasalle videos and stuff and, and some of his maths comp stuff and he's using the table in much the same way but obviously with much more complex maths by the time you get to you know secondary school and um, but on occasions, if, if I've ever tried to get pupils to divine how to work systematically, it hasn't, hasn't manifested, you know? I think the more explicit we can be in year three, saying this is a really useful tool, and um, this is how it's used, step one, step two, step three, and that allows them then to look for these really, really beautiful patterns, you know, 
in in sort of what is what mid fears and you know mid primary fears and mathematics and and I think yeah when, when I hear you talk about step by step through a scientific inquiry and I get the same sensation where if you take them step by step it's only then that you can really see all that's wonderful because you've got those core behaviors and down pat yeah so I'm, I'm I can see that one of the great things about doing these very small steps inquiries as well is that things that you don't realize you're going to need to teach you teach them without the things that you would never dream of putting in a plan when you're doing these step-by-step -step inquiries you naturally teach them so i'll give you an example you've just poured water from a beaker into a measuring cylinder to get a certain amount and then you say to the you just say to the kids oh obviously now move your beaker to the corner of the table so it's out of the way put it over there so you're not going to knock it over you've used it it's done put it somewhere else so it's out of the way so you can focus on the measuring cylinder and whatever else you're going to do with it that's not something you would dream of putting in your plan but you see children go oh oh that makes sense and you see them move it out of the way and you see them now have this little working area that is less cluttered and that's a really useful skill i mean i've I've fallen foul of forgetting to do that in chemistry labs. So I wish I'd been taught it at primary school. But at the same time, you, it, yeah, it's those little skills that you don't think that aren't going to be on the national curriculum about self-organization when it comes to doing a scientific experiment. That if you break things into small steps, you will teach them almost automatically. So yeah, another reason I would advocate the, the gradual build-up towards independent inquiries from something very structured to begin with. One of the components of the national curriculum is about presenting ideas, both through presentations, writing things up. I've had the most success over the years of getting children to write things up in a relatively structured manner by teaching them one chunk of that at a time. So in say year three, you might only get them to write up their results and everything else is already there for them or except for perhaps the um dis a bit of discussion at the end of their results and you guide them through that you know you'll literally you'll talk about it together and then you'll say oh okay we've decided upon this this is our sentence let's pop that into our book with neatest handwriting off we go done but the only thing you got them to do and really focus on was the results table or perhaps the bar graph or whatever it might have been that you think the one thing you explicitly focused upon breaking inquiries down and your inquiry write-ups down into that step-by-step -step pieces allows children by the time they're in year six for you to go okay you finish the inquiry you know the steps we're going to write it up today off you go i mean actually that's quite for me that's a real high level bit of science progression if you can get a year six to that point where you can just say okay today we're writing our inquiry write up there's the vocab you might need so it's spelled correctly you know what equipment we used you know what you did you know what you found i want to see what you come up with in the discussion based on your results 45 minutes off you go in silence if you get to that point then you're probably doing some something pretty special i think if you get to that point those core principles are embedded the whole way across the school you know, it's a, it's a collaborative collaborative effort to get to that point. You know, and then, and like you say, you know, I'm so on board. In fact, I I would have been a much better science teacher if I'd met you ten years before. <laughs> oh no, because if you'd met me ten years before, I would have still been useless myself. So, <laughs> yeah. Um. Well, because back to the time travel, I could have gone forward. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> um. Yeah, uh, and, and that sort of leads into the next bit then, because I think, yeah, it, if you're doing that and you get to that point, it is across the school a really strong approach to teaching science. What are the challenges in leadership, and particularly with, with respect to science? In some ways, I'm going to talk about exactly the same things I already have done, but from a different angle. I would say, obviously, one of the biggest challenges, your teacher's subject knowledge and the misconceptions that may, they may have, which, again, so you as a science leader, even if you are buying a curriculum product 
that's brought in and there it is your job is to go through and to find all the potential misconceptions and if you're not sure what they are then there are books out there and there are curriculum products out there that are freely available that will help you to spot these things for those who are a science coordinator right now and are thinking can you give me a bit of a hint or a head start weight and gravity as i say terminal velocity is a key one evolution people will end up teaching or often will end up teaching what is effectively Lamarckian evolution, the idea that animals change within their lifetime because of the environment they're in, and then they pass that on, which is not how natural selection works. So you've got to be really careful about that one. We've mentioned the Earth's tilt. Keep an eye out for those ones. Find the misconceptions that your teachers hold, and then don't be afraid to do a CPD session where you say, today we're just going to look at misconceptions. Now, I know this is going to be a slightly unfashionable thing to say because people will tell me that professional development has to have an element of practice in order to be successful. And I think that's very true in a great deal of circumstances. But when it comes to teaching teachers about misconceptions, I don't think that necessarily holds. You show a teacher that they're wrong about something in their subject knowledge and they don't forget it. So it's one of these areas where you can have some really quick wins. Root first thing to do as a subject lead deal with misconceptions. The second thing I talk about, the big challenges of being a subject lead and how we can deal with them in science, I'm kind of going to combine the working scientifically and the inquiries part of it together. I've mentioned it before, make inquiry write-ups formulaic. It, they might not be the most exciting things in the world, but if every time the children are writing um, an inquiry that has a brief introduction, a description of equipment, method, results, discussion. And then every time it does that. Again, someone out there who really loves their science teaching is going to be screaming at me for the lack of ambition, for the fact that, what well, the same kind of style of write-up every time you want children to do an inquiry write-up, isn't that limiting? It is. And it's limiting for a reason, because I would rather have definite success in a given area than have teachers including me, fail with something much grander. Start from there, get a particular style of inquiry write up with a particular formula embedded across your school. And if you find that children can deal with that quite comfortably by year four or year five, then you've got time to maybe nudge things around, get them writing up um, inquiries that aren't fair tests, get them in writing up their views on what they found from secondary sources and other kinds of inquiry. Another thing that we've kind of discussed and it's implied, but I'm going to say it anyway, is you have to get your science cupboards sorted. And that means in a lot of cases, bin bags. It means lots and lots of bin bags. You will find equipment in most science cupboards that is 30 or 40 years old and no one's had the guts to throw it out throw out anything that you are not 90% sure at least is going to be useful. If you're only 85% sure it's going to be used, get rid. Because if you as the science coordinator can't decide whether it's going to be used or not, I promise you the teacher, there's no teacher going in that science cupboard and going, ooh, no one's used that for a while. No, it doesn't happen. Or if it happens once in a blue moon and what you gain from keeping it you lose from having a messy science cupboard that puts people off doing inquiries. In an ideal world, and this is ideal, and I'm hopefully going to be able to give you some advice on how you might achieve this later. In an ideal world, you set up boxes. These are the six inquiries that we do across year one. These are the six boxes that are full of equipment. And your job, or one of your jobs as science lead, is at the end of every year to make sure that there's enough soil or sugar or yeast or whatever it is in some of these boxes for the teachers to be able to do the, the inquiries that you want them to do. So that's a bit of a, a reach in some cases and often it ends up leading to science cupboards that feel half empty but I promise a half empty organized science cupboard where a teacher can go and pick up a box is so much more valuable so much more valuable. In fact, I'd go as far as to say that the, the most valuable thing you can invest in as a science coordinator isn't new equipment, it's boxes that you can put inquiries into. What I find is when you do set up boxes like this and teachers just put stuff 
everything they brought into the classroom back into the box, you don't end up with a messy science cupboard and everything goes back in one place anyway. So it's just that much more easy to deal with. It's only when teachers have to go back and go, oh, where do the measuring cylinders go? Where do the beakers belong? Where do I put the thermometers? It's only when they do all that, that a busy teacher who needs to be out of the school before it closes in five minutes ends up just putting thermometers in the nearest tray, which is, you know, we've all been there. So like I say, with inquiries, develop a baseline. And if that means six inquiries across every year group that span the five different inquiry types that you'll find related to the national curriculum, then so be it. If there are six inquiries, one every half term, they take a lesson or two lessons. And that means that children only, and I, you know, big air quotes around that, if they only get 36 quality inquiries between year one and year six that you have specified and curated to make sure that they cover the breadth of the national curriculum, then so be it. And if you can then build up after that, once your teachers are confident with those, wonderful. But again, if you do 36 quality inquiries and the teachers finish the year and think, you know what, science wasn't so bad. I can, yeah, I can see myself enjoying teaching that next year. Then you've, you've, you've done better than a lot of schools do for science. And that's your jumping off point. I guess all of this brings me on to the big message that I would add, which is about a quality science curriculum and what that entails. It means a curriculum that's accessible for the teachers. And as I say, prevents misconceptions at the point of use. A curriculum that includes the key concepts that come up over and over and over again, such as, you know, an insulator, because that comes up not only twice in electricity, but you're obviously going to get thermal insulators as well. It includes the key vocabulary that you want children to come away with. The vocabulary you really want children to have must come up over and over again. Otherwise, they're not taking it with them to secondary school. It really should have links, ideally, not just within science to all other bits of science they've done, but across the curriculum. So, for example, lots of schools I've seen or I've worked in end up teaching the water cycle twice, once in science and once in geography. Well, why? <laughs> why do that? You've got, to, you've got to make sure that it's joined up with other aspects of the curriculum that you have at your school ideally you would put into there something that talks about science careers because i know that one of the things that when you talk to outside organizations and they talk about primary science the, the thing they kind of hammer home a lot is how children end up leaving primary school with these big misconceptions about what a scientist is and what a scientist does and often these are quite limiting misconceptions and so I think with very little effort, you can discuss the range of scientific careers, the idea of a scientific communicator, the idea of a scientist that works with government, all sorts of different scientists. I think ideally you have links to actual important scientists. You, you cur curate the curriculum and say, well, you know what, we're going to talk about Catherine Johnson, we're gonna talk about Marie Curie, and we're gonna talk about Isaac Newton, etc." Um, ideally as well you'd have embedded reading in there as we talked earlier going back to full circle right back to your initial point about how in your view it we wouldn't be missing out a great deal if we really focused on reading writing and arithmetic as such and I have a lot of sympathy for that point of view and part of that must mean that we're embedding reading into all subjects including science and for those of you who know me from Twitter, you know where this is all going. If you are lost on this stuff, or if you don't think your science curriculum in school is up to scratch and you want a little bit of direction, I can't promise that what I've made is perfect, but I have put together a science curriculum document over the past couple of years. It has all those things that I've mentioned, including suggested inquiries um, and ready-made reading texts for years two to six. I would highly advocate that you check it out. It might be of value to you. Worst case scenario, you pick it up, you look at it and say, this isn't as good as what we already have in school. But if that's the case, then yeah, you're, in my view, you're probably doing something really well to begin with. But I do think that a lot of schools will find some value and some utility 
in my science curriculum document. So yeah, find that on Twitter. It's, it's also on my blog, Primary Colour. I'm sure I'll be able to persuade, to persuade Kieran to link it up in his show notes as well. So yeah, do that. I, I love how you're going to great pains to separate yourself from my, <laughs> what I'm feeling are, are quite radical views on, on curriculum. <laughs> no, no, not at all. Not at all, Kira. <laughs> I'm, I'm slightly scared that re reading, writing, arithmetic as the, the three R's kind of curriculum, I, I can, you know, I can see some pushback on that one. <laughs> no, um, yeah, it's um, really, it, it's, it's mainly a device to give you front and center stage um you know because of the two of us talking about um talking about science i know who i'd rather listen to on on misconceptions and teachers wanting to hear about misconceptions harry fletcher wood has a chapter in the research ed guide to education myths and he obviously he's, he's talking about misconceptions in terms of teaching and learning and how it's really difficult to convince people that they're wrong in that sense. Are, are you drawing a distinction between misconceptions about pedagogy and misconceptions about subject knowledge? Because I've certainly had conversations with people about um, the nuances of growth mindset or um, the learning styles and the lack of empirical evidence. Um, and it hasn't changed anyone's opinion. You know, over time, lots of people have come around, but it's taken a lot of effort. Are you suggesting that it might be possible to get get to the heart of science misconceptions more easily and more readily than uh, than, than teaching misconceptions? One hundred percent. Teachers are much more invested in pedagogical ideas, things they've taught for years, often because they've been embedded in maybe a thousand lessons that they've taught. And equally, with something like growth mindset, there is still interesting debate around that you can't just say to someone well google it we'll google it together and i'll show you you can do that with misconceptions around terminal velocity you can do that with misconceptions around what causes the seasons it's it's so i don't want to having already said that science has embedded within it the fallibility of human knowledge i don't want to say it's black and white whether whether people are wrong obviously the nature of science is that it's always probability you know it's always you know even something like um something pretty uncontro uncontroversial like man-made climate change is a thing it's still even for the vast majority it, it, all scientists by definition is still a probability it's just it's a probability like well it's 99.99 percent in my view you know everything is just a probability because that's the nature of inductive reasoning. You know, the sun will rise tomorrow is inductive reasoning, but there's a day when it won't. So it's, it's always probability. That aside, most of the stuff that's misconceptions is Googleable. And um, I think I've had this conversation with a lot of people. I think to an extent, it's more difficult to be science lead than it is to lead a core subject, you know? Um, and you just have to look at what happened to the science results when they moved from everybody being tested to sample testing. Because I think I'm not even sure if it broke 30%, you know, and I don't, you know, every couple of years, everybody is done. And, you know, the, um, the attainment in this standardized assessment plummeted the minute it, it moved away from a, uh, you know, the position it had when I started teaching. I mean, the interesting thing is that's partly because the nature of science and because of the nature of the way that we assess science, it's a bit like GPS in that you can really push outcomes by doing lots of revision. You know, just lots of retrieval, lots of revision. These are the key facts that are going to come up, push outcomes. Can't do that with reading, not really. But getting back to your point about it being more difficult to run it effectively in some cases. I, I think there's some truth in that, partly because of what I've mentioned with regards to science cupboards, partly because of misconceptions, but also the fact that it's still given a certain prominence in the curriculum. 
and yet a science coordinator is unlikely to get any time outside of their curriculum time to deal with it. So I remember I moved from being, and I hated this job, and I still hate this expression, which is the reason I moved. I was the gifted and talented coordinator, and I became the science coordinator, mainly because of how much I whinged about the phrase gifted and talented. Um, and there was part of me that thought, well, maybe gifted and talented coordinator wasn't so bad after all, after I saw the science covered. But like I say, it's basically the biggest subject you can do without really getting any of the time, and in some cases, TLR, payment, whatever, to deal with it. So yeah, it can be a bit of a bum job. But I like to think that the science curriculum document that I'm pointing teachers towards might make that bum job a little bit easier. And if you know, teachers do have any questions about it. I don't think I was the greatest science coordinator in the world. I don't think I was the greatest science teacher in the world, but I do think I might be able to be useful if anyone has questions. Yeah, the um, the, the, the science documents are fantastic. Um, and like I say, I wish I'd met you 10 years, um, 10 years earlier than I did. Um, but I certainly wish I'd had those documents, you know, 12, 13, 14 years ago. Um, because you you wouldn't be sitting beside or in front of the um, the sham of a science teacher that I've described myself as <laughs> in this in this episode. Um, but I know like Tom Sharon was a big fan of some science work you did um, a couple of years ago now. Um, yeah, he um, was kindly promoted version one in um, his research head talk. And he, he effectively, when he went from primary school to primary school, I believe it might have been one primary school, but I think it was as he worked with some primary schools, he referred to those documents as evidence or an example, I should say, of decent, at least, science um, coordination of a curriculum. Which, I mean, unless I'm mistaken, he was originally a science teacher before he moved into leadership. So I am happy to take whatever praise he can offer on that. So, yeah, but like I said, just, just worth noting that that was version one. The curriculum documents 2.0, where the overviews are separated into year groups, where inquiries are specified, where reading texts that for every topic from year two to year six are attached is available and is, to my mind, far superior. Nice. So basically, if you, if you want to be less like me and more like Chris, and um, then, you know, you've got to check out those documents. <laughs> that, that, that's basically my synopsis of this conversation. I've done a lot of talking in this episode, so it's nice for me to be able to throw a question from social media your way. A question that came up on Twitter was from a teacher who, uh, who said, that they are teaching decimals to a year five class or they're about to teach decimals to a year five class. And they currently think that the, te the children are lacking some of the knowledge from year four. So that'd be almost the beginning of decimals. What advice do you have for that teacher? Yeah, that was, that was a great question. Really good conversation. Um, and I think my advice at the time was to find out precisely where the pupils are. Because obviously with two slash three lockdowns, depending on where you were in the, in the country, there's a lot of sort of fundamentals that may have been missed. And decimals and fractions in year five can go quite far, quite quickly. Um, so I, I would, you know, for instance, use a diagnostic question or two you know, really carefully chosen one, you know, like diagnosticquestion.com has lots of examples from people like the White Rose and other teachers who've designed their own. Have a look at those and decide which questions you can use to find out the sort of fundamental piece of information. Because if you find out that your pupils are missing an understanding of the magnitude of decimals, and sort of these these numbers smaller than one, and um, then your approach is going to be very different than if it's just a case of they need a bit of a refresher, and then you can move on to, 
using place value counters, you know, for easy manipulation while you are calculating. Um, or it may be the extent of the number of places. You know, I think we go up to three places um, in the English national curriculum. And so you may find that actually tenths, fine, hundredths, fine, but thousands, thousands, never sure how to say that. And, um, you know, so you can really refine your focus because I think if you start from where they are and you get a, I get a good idea of what, what's missing, then you'll normally find that in year five, they're old enough that you can push them on really quickly. And um, so that would be my advice because you need to ascertain exactly what's missing and then you can address it because you're not going to get that six months back. But if you're really precise in identifying what your pupils need to learn next, then you get the biggest gains, I think. So that, that, that's how I approach it. But it sounded like the teacher had a really good system in place. And, um, you know, they were repurposing base 10 equipment so that the thousand block became one. And, then, you know, that, that's perfect. And they just need time to assimilate that understanding of scale and magnitude. Because once they've done that, that's essentially all of number, you know, internalized because we can go smaller, we can go larger, but we've said before, do we really understand what that means? I don't think we do. Um, so yeah, this is basically the last big step they're gonna take in terms of understanding the magnitude. And if they've got that, you can move on to other things in with regards to decimals, but if they don't, that's your priority and there's nothing better than base 10 equipment in that situation totally agree i've just while you're talking about that i've just thought something one advantage at actually potentially about the fact that perhaps these children have missed the decimal teaching in year four and it's going to sound odd to describe this as an advantage but it's this idea that you as a teacher or this this person as a teacher might be able to take them through decimals from the beginning partly or almost from the beginning because I know there's some bits and pieces in the year three national curriculum partly because I've seen teaching in the past where a year four teacher who only has to deal with tenths and hundredths has introduced children to the concept through um, use of a two-dimensional representation that looks like a hundred square with no numbers in it and then have gone well that's a hundredth and then a line down is a tenth and so we can go count them and that's seems great until you get to year five and then you're then saying okay so what's a thousandth how's that represented and yes you can take one of those boxes and divide it into ten but it's not set up as a representation to be ready for you to deal with thousands whereas like you say the base 10 equipment is set up for that it's set up for you to be able to go well this what was like say a repurposed thousand block becomes one the slice becomes a tenth a stick becomes a hundredth and a smaller cube becomes a thousandth and it's just ready made for that three decimal place understanding which sometimes children won't be but again that comes into the coherence of an individual curriculum doesn't it because where I've seen in other schools this idea of, you know, setting children up with the hundred square in order to represent tenths and hundredths, there hasn't necessarily been that coherence of representation. There hasn't been that thought about how that works from year four going into year five, which more than anything goes back to a point that we bring up a lot on this podcast about the importance of a coherent curriculum and how you come to um have one of those in your school yeah well and admittedly much much more difficult at this present time because people are prioritizing that which will help them and their pupils next year and um, but i've definitely you know because we, we've talked about a substantial gap between the use of base 10 equipment for integers and then the use of base 10 equipment for decimals and I've definitely given the advice this term or this year since, you know, big return was on 8th of March. I said, push that D term six because you've just come back and you've revisited place value to make sure you've got a good base to, from which to go on to. Give it eight weeks and then try the decimals, you know, because any, any shorter, you know, in, in my mind, it's years, but circumstances must are circumstances the way they are. 
you know, give yourself as much time as possible. And although I, I understand that by the time this goes out, we will be reasonably close to the start of term six, if not in term six. So, um, yeah, ho hopefully that's useful. Worth noting, just on that point you make about leaving a gap with regards to base 10, this brings us back beautifully to a point you made earlier where you were talking about um, changing people's minds. And I wanted to say at the time, but I almost, I, I left it, which is that with changing people's minds with ped pedagogy, it's often more about planting a seed than it is about, you know, reforming that opinion in one go. And I think this is a perfect example of that because I remember us having a discussion probably six months ago where I suggested to you that I thought that place value counters as a representation that children use and have in front of them was pot potentially limited. And I think partly that came down to my negative experiences of trying to use them for six digit numbers and this sort of thing at a previous school. You planted that seed and in the five or six months since then where I've been looking at curriculum decisions and I've been thinking about how do you get that gap so that children can be using base 10 purely for decimals. Well, part of that, I think, ideally involves that little change from Dean's equipment transitioning into place value counters, potentially towards the start of uh, while you're still dealing with numbers up to a thousand. And that transition there leaves you with the gap. So, yeah, just thought I'd bring that up as a nice little full circle about people do change their mind on pedagogy. Just sometimes it's like more about planting a seed and then letting them feel like they've changed their mind on their own. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try to keep that in mind next time I'm trying to convince you of something. <laughs> and so I guess it, it, it's been an absolute pleasure as always, Chris. Great to have you back for one of these chats. Loved it. Loved it. So I think all that's left to say is um, thank you very much to everyone who's listening and we'll see you next time. Thank you.